Ah, welcome back to Think Tech on a given Thursday morning. Um, we're here talking about tax, talking tax with Tom Yamachika of the Hawaii uh, Tax Foundation. Uh, Tom, welcome back to the show. It's always nice to have you here to elucid elucidate us on public policy, fiscal policy, and all things related. Thanks for coming down. Well, thank you, Jay. It's nice to be back on the show. So uh, we're, we're talking today about uh, some very special actions taken by the governor um, to set aside uh, uh, statutory structures in Hawaii, in, uh, in one and in, in a number of articles that have come up, um, some having to do directly with tax and some not. Can you, can you talk about what the governor has done that's, that's remarkable here in, in the face of the COVID emergency? Sure. Um, Beginning with the declaration of the COVID emergency, uh, the governor has made a series of proclamations and executive orders uh, that have, you know, knocked down uh, sections and sometimes whole chapters of the HRS, uh, the Hawaii Revised Statute, uh, in in uh, a, a way to promote his handling of the emergency, perhaps. Uh, so his his proclamation says, under you know legal authority, uh, I've suspended certain laws, and uh, you know some of them are kind of fairly straightforward, like um, uh, the collective bargaining law. He 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 wanted to uh, suspend the collective bargaining law so he had flexibility to move people between departments if. Um, uh, if the need arose, and, and by God, the need arose, uh, but was he able to move people between departments? Uh, turns out that no. That was a political thing. That was a political thing. The, the unions pushed back, um, and uh, you know we don't know how how that's uh, going to wind up. But let me there was some let me see if it's the same thing I've been thinking about. There was a a story a week or two ago about uh, how uh, a, a huge but indeterminate number of state employees were at home being paid for work they were not doing, um, full pay, but no work. And um, it was a great concern because that, that, that kind of benefit did not apply to a whole lot of people in the private sector. <clears throat> and somebody suggested that, wait, uh, we have a lot of work to do, other agencies, uh, could use these employees to do work for them. Um, they could be um, transferred, re repurposed into other work for other agencies. And uh, HG HGEA opposed that. And uh, its position was you have to pay these workers who stay at home with full pay a 25% bonus if you want to do that. And uh, as I recall, uh, David Ige said, uh, no, I can't. I really can't do that. I can't do that. And so it, it locked up on that. And they did not move. They were not repurposed. And they were not um, paid a bonus to move. Uh, at the end, it sounded like it was only a matter of money. Um, so whether or not he set aside the union provisions, as you mentioned, the fact is it, um, it died an awful death. It was a good idea. Uh, it would have solved some problems in terms of state, uh, state functionality in the emergency. But it, it didn't go anywhere. That's my recollection. Right. Now, one, one of the other laws uh, that did get suspended uh, was one tax law, and that was in the transient accommodations tax area. There is a, a statute in the transient accommodations tax area uh, that specifies how the collected monies from the transient accommodations tax is going to go. So right now it says that a certain amount is going to be uh, paid for tourism promotion and certain amounts will be paid uh, to the uh, the Turtle Bay easement. Uh, certain amounts going to be paid to the counties. Uh, and, and this uh, provision was a subject of heated dispute within the legislature uh, for the past several years. And, and, and the governor with the stroke of his pen says, okay, this doesn't apply anymore. So uh, as a result, um, uh, the, when, when the Big Island budget recently came out a couple of days ago, uh, it, it, it included like zero uh, for money from the state, from the transient accommodation tax. 
uh, apparently because uh, the county of Hawaii officials had been led to believe uh, that there was, you know, no money that's going to be coming, uh, you know, zero, not a zilch. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, we wrote about that. We, we kind of questioned, well, um, look, guys, uh, the authority to suspend laws uh, is triggered when you have an existing law that impedes emergency function. So, oh, what emergency functions are being impeded and uh, that, that would justify a suspension of this law? If the answer is, oh, we're not getting you know, enough money for emergency functions, then the same argument can be used for almost anything that obligates any government agency to do anything or spend any money. So uh, it, it appears to be writing with a very, very broad brush. Well, I think I think one one thing that flows out of it, which we should discuss, is that is that he didn't suspend the whole TAT. He suspended only a part of the TAT. That part that um, required distribution of some of the TAT receipts to the, the counties. Am I right? Uh, the TAT is still theoretically in effect. It's just been modified. So what he did is it, he didn't he didn't suspend it. He suspended part of it, and the the net effect of that is. He changed the law with the stroke of a pen, even though you could not make a good case that this was in aid of resolving an emergency. He, he simply changed the law. He rewrote the law. Right. So that's what, what happened in, in that case. Um, there, there are several examples. Uh, in the sixth supplementary proclamation, there are now seven. Um, there was a list of laws that had been suspended or changed that's 17 pages long. Um, so uh, it's very hard to imagine that at least some of those are not going to be overreached. You know? Yeah. Does this, does this compare with, uh, I don't know if you know, but this, with what uh, Trump has been doing? Has he been doing executive orders to suspend um, existing statutes and parts of statutes in this way? Um, not, to, not to the same extent. I mean, uh, Trump has been working with Congress and Congress has passed laws to you know, give us these like the PPP loans and um, EIDLs and, and other you know, things to get the economy moving. Uh, we don't know whether or to what extent the administration's been working with the legislature at all. I mean, certainly there haven't been, uh, you know, the same joint press conferences that we saw at the beginning of the session, where they kind of, you know, linked hands and went kumbaya and said, we have this, uh, you know, great package of bills to uh, provide justice to the poor and shore up our economy and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's basically been the governor himself doing news conferences and uh, and saying this is how it's going to be, uh, period. You know, it's uh, interesting because they could have the conferences now, even though the legislature is not in session. The leadership uh, on both uh, House and Senate could join him in a conference. They could speak at least on behalf of, of the leadership, if not uh, the whole legislature. No, <clears> but no. they choose not to do that. Instead, it seems to be fragmented into uh, committees which were created essentially after they went into recess. Um, committees which uh, only have the, the power of the pulpit, they limited power of the pulpit rather than any legislative um, power at all. So uh, I find it very interesting that the, the governor does that. And I guess it's uh, his perception of how you deal with the public. I, I, I don't know why he would want to make himself more popular. I don't think what he's done does make him more popular. <clears throat> and uh, it's a strange moment. By the way, uh, you've heard, as I have, right, that the legislature is planning on coming back in, into session within the next week or so. Yeah. I've heard that, yes. Yeah. So when it comes back, Tom, um, it, can, it can immediately pass laws that would reverse. Am I right? That would reverse what the governor has done in the interim, no? No, it's going to take time. 
um, you have to start with bill introduction and and, and go through the hearing process, um, three readings in each house and all that kind of thing. Uh, it's it's not going to be easy to do that uh, when you start mid session. Mm, yeah, it would be pandemonium. Right. Yeah, the other the now, other, the, thing, the other some... thing that I wanted to kind of you know put on the table uh, was that among the other laws that were suspended and you know I, I talked about entire chapters being suspended uh, was the uh, open records law, uh, Chapter 92F. Uh, in the second supplementary proclamation and continuing through the sixth supplementary proclamation, uh, the open records laws were suspended in their entirety. And uh, even the Office of Information Practices came out and said, okay, uh, what that means, agencies, uh, is that if somebody asks you for records, uh, you can ignore them. What does that got to do with the emergency? That's 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 exactly my question. What does that have to do with the emergency? Uh, yes, it takes time to respond to a record request, uh, and theoretically, that means you have one fewer person able to do emergency functions if the agency is doing emergency functions. Um, and if, if if you're talking about, for example, the Department of Labor, yeah, you maybe they got a case, uh, but other agencies, you know, it, it, it's it's more of a close call. But well, it, it's, uh, as you said, a broad brush. Um, what strikes me, though, is um, that what he's saying, or maybe saying, it's not clear, I don't know if he's actually articulated this, is that he doesn't want these agencies uh, to be burdened with the necessity of having staff do work. These are the agencies where the staff isn't there, it's not doing work. Whether they're paid or not is another issue, which we talked about. But if they're home and they're not working, um, they, they cannot perform. So what he's really saying is, uh, since they cannot perform, I'm going to excuse them for, from, from performing. I don't know if that really makes sense in times of an emergency. Uh, I think they could perform. There are a lot of ways you can actually do stuff while you're having this emergency. So it really... It uh, doesn't make sense, and and it is scary. Uh, can we talk about the scary part now? Uh, let me just kind of finish up with this chapter, and then you know we'll go on to your your scary stuff. Um, so, uh, in the seventh supplementary proclamation, which just came out, uh, the governor partially reversed himself on that. In, you know, uh, at the urging of you know several watchdog groups. Um, uh, and is spearheaded by the Civil Beat Law Center. Uh, and now the agencies at least have to keep track of the records requests that came in during the emergency. And they do have to respond to them uh, as their resources permit. But, but, they, but they can't just, you know, uh, toss it in the trash can like they could before. So uh, that I think is a, you know, a step in the right direction. Mm. So what's the scary part? Well, I mean, it's kind of like what Trump was doing with the wall and redirecting funds in the name of an emergency. Now, his emergency back two years ago, that was not an emergency at all. And I wouldn't want to confuse that kind of thing with what we have here. We really do have an emergency. But we do have, I think, the burden of connecting um, the suspension of laws to the emergency. Otherwise, you could have an emergency, whether it's fabricated or not, um, and you could suspend all the laws you want and all the taxes you want, and you could rewrite the laws. And, and you know, you've got to be very careful when you suspend laws. You, you've got to have a reason. There's got to be a causal connection, a logical connection. And, and I don't think that he's really made that case. Uh, so what we have here is the, the ghost of Christmas future. When a governor, or for that matter, uh, a national executive, um, can change things all over the board in the name of an emergency, rewriting statutes left and right, and waiting for somebody to try to stop him or her. Um, and, you know, if the, if the legislature is not in session, and as you say, even if it is in session, it takes a while, uh, and it's a political process that it's not, it's not quick. 
like the stroke of a pen in a proclamation is quick. Um, furthermore, yeah, I mean, I mean, basically, what we have now uh, is we have the governor who has the ability to exercise dictatorial power. Yeah, and um, uh, we got to make sure that there are checks and balances to make sure it's not really dictatorial power. Yeah, so, somehow I feel you know that what's happening in Washington is um, it it has the, it has an effect of kind of leaking out, leaking out underfoot into the states. Uh, I mean, if Trump hadn't been doing this kind of wild proclamation that he's been doing, uh, then I don't think that David Ige would have done this either. He's taking a, a cue from what is happening in Washington. It, it seems to be, um, you know, a blessing, uh, uh, an approval of this kind of, um, uh, you know, conduct. The other thing is, where are the courts? Where are the litigators? Where are the agencies, uh, the institutions that would try to protect our constitution? That would say, wait a minute, there is no causal connection here. Why are you just rewriting legislation across the board? You can't do that. Are you aware of any litigation that anybody has started, Tom, to test out whether the governor's actions are appropriate or constitutional? Well, um, uh, uh our organization, in collaboration with uh, the you know, Civil Law Center, uh, Common Cause, and a bunch of others, you know, we were thinking about it. Um, but we wanted to uh, see if we could negotiate a solution first. And, and that's kind of what uh, Brian Black's been, uh, been doing over the past few weeks, uh, trying to negotiate a solution. And uh, at least it, it you know, gathered some movement. Uh, because what what has to happen if you're going to challenge the law uh, is that the challenge goes before a three judge court in, in the circuit courts. So you know whatever island uh, the challenge is brought on, you, you get a three judge circuit court panel, and they and, and they got to figure it out. Uh, the uh, you know the law says that the proceeding is expedited, but you know who who knows how long they're going to take to rule? Uh, they have to give uh, you know the state you know, a certain number of days to respond. Um, and of course, you can, you can kind of, you can kind of see what the state would probably come back with. You know, are you serious guys? This is an emergency. We have people called upon to, uh, you know, process unemployment claims that have been, that have, that have gone through the roof and you want them to do this? Come on. And, and, you know, what, what court in, in, in its right mind is going to stop, um, you, you know, that kind of perfectly reasonable exercise of power. What about the media, Tom? I mean, you've written, um, you've written in Civil Beat. Did you, did you appear in the Star Advertiser? Has anyone else um, questioned um, this kind of expansive power? Uh, various people have. Um, Grassroot Institute has. A uh, common cause has a uh, common cause. Actually, was the the, the writer of a uh, a letter uh, that was signed by some fifty uh, public watchdog groups um, and and published. Uh, but there's a bit, but there's been no court action that I know. Of. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you shake it and bake it, what you get is a, is a certain amount of complaint going on about this, um, which I believe is valid. Um, and and the, the legislature is not in session, and they decided to go out of session when uh, one legislator uh, tested positive. Um, I'm not sure that was the right decision, or that they could not have continued uh, in session, maybe with... Um, you know, the rules of personal contact, social distancing, somehow, somehow uh, built in. Um, and so no, no action legally has been taken to reverse any of these decisions, which, which are really mm, questionable um, and, and probably won't be taken until A, uh, sometime later in this legislative session and B, sometime later when, when court actions are filed and and dealt with, it's not gonna happen right away. So what happens is an executive who has this power of proclamation and suspension of laws, and I'm not sure exactly what the you know, legal, uh, legal authority is on that. That's a research question, I suppose. 
Um, this executive can act immediately under that color of authority, and then everybody else has to question it much later, long after the decision is made. Um, this is troubling, this is scary. And, and what it tells me is that if you are an executive and you are going to suspend laws that are not directly connected to the emergency by any logic, then you gotta really think twice about that or, you, or you'd be looking a lot like Trump. Um, and and I'm, I'm very worried that this is setting a precedent. I don't know about other states. Have you looked into other states, whether other governors are doing the same thing? Uh, some people have been. Um, when the, uh, the 92F, the public records laws and the, and the public meetings laws suspensions were announced, uh, several groups came out and said this was the most extreme action taken anywhere in the nation. Interesting. Interesting. You know, and, and, and we are, I would say, lucky that we only have a few cases right now. We're, our curve has been, you know, never been that high. Um, and, uh, you know, people- We flattened are, the curve. Well, I don't know if we flattened it or it was flat to start with. I, I haven't seen the, the actual curve. I, in any event, I, I think we're lucky. But, you know, one thing I would note is that there's been plenty of talk and plenty of reporting. And I mean, Josh Green has been very good about being transparent and, and, and being an advocate for public health instead of reopening the economy, which I think that's the right choice and the right sequence. Um, but, you know, we haven't, we haven't flooded the town with masks. We haven't flooded the town with testing. Um, and in that way, we're, we're similar to the national experience. Uh, that's where the effort should have been uh, and still should be um, by the governor. Instead of suspending parts of tax laws, um, it seems to me that's what he should be doing and reporting to us if he wants to make us feel confident in a reopening. But if you say, we got all these problems, now forget about the problems, just forget about that. We're gonna reopen, even though we haven't solved the problems. Just because we have luckily flattened the curve doesn't mean that we're out of the woods. We still have to do the things we said we were gonna do. And that means masks. I mean, it's very hard to get a mask. Uh, an N95 mask, harder yet. Uh, and how comfortable can you feel if you can't get a mask? How comfortable can you feel when it's really shaky as to whether you can get a test? Uh, we're not going to feel comfortable about this until we have those things. We should have tracking too. We don't have tracking. We have, you know, virtually, I, I, I challenge the government. We have virtually nobody tracking and no software tracking in this state. We need to do that if we go reopen. And I mean, I'm not sure what his position is right now today, because it has changed back and forth on reopening. Uh, that's another, you know, executive prerogative, I guess, another mm, uh, proclamation, I guess, about reopening. You know the status of that time? Uh, again, well, I think what you've heard and what I've heard is the same, uh, that the reopening is gonna come in stages. The first one uh, was set forth in the seventh supplementary proclamation saying that um, you know certain businesses can reopen as of today uh, and you know there was I guess some disagreement between uh, the state and the counties of Honolulu and Maui on was that included shopping malls so uh, that kind of got backtracked to uh, the 15th of the month but other types of businesses like uh, pet groomers, nonprofits, um, Businesses without a lot of physical contact uh, can reopen. As yeah. it should be. Well, I think it's, there's a lot of pressure in Hawaii to start up the tourism, uh, you know, machine, the engine of our economy, so to speak. Um, but uh, that's pretty dangerous. It's dangerous even now in dribs and drabs. I mean, the idea of uh, telling a tourist he can come here on condition that he spends two weeks in in quarantine in a hotel room that costs plenty of money and not go out um, and have no mm, reliable enforcement mechanism to stop him from going out. Somebody suggested the other day that he wear an ankle bracelet, such as, a, um, such as a, uh, somebody who was a defendant in a criminal proceeding would wear, um, but they don't have ankle bracelets. You'd need thousands of them 
in order to do that. There's no way to enforce this. And so the result is, um, yeah, we might earn a little uh, TAT. We might have a, a couple of people going into the shops, such as might be open. I'm not sure when they're supposed to open. Um, but, but the bottom line is there's a risk for every one of those people. They come, they're in, asymptomatic. It's ridiculous to uh, ask them, uh, you know, have, have, have you got a temperature? Let me take your temperature. That's meaningless because an asymptomatic person without temperature can be a carrier and shed vi a virus all over our state. So, you know, are we being rational about this? All in the name of collecting a few bucks for TAT and collecting a few bucks for the gross excise tax. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not clear on the government policy because I don't think the policy is clear. Uh, this is very risky business to open the gates again. Isn't it? Well, I guess you want to choose your poison then, death by virus or, or, or death by starvation. Because <laughs> for some people, that's what it is. Is it? Do we have that? Do we have that? Death by starvation? I, don't, I haven't uh, seen that in the papers, but uh, uh, I, I, I have seen stories that, you know, uh, people are uh, suffering a lot. Um, they, they've been living from one paycheck to another. Uh, and when that stops, what are they going to do? Well, you know, we've it had a number, of, a number of talk shows about, uh, you know, where is the unemployment insurance and uh, where are those thousand dollar checks and uh, are those loans really helping these, uh, these employees who are out of work? terminated and out of work. Um, very hard. And it requires a whole combination of things. Um, and you know, the problem is that if you reopen, you have to do it in steps. That's the only rational thing to do. But if you do it in steps, it takes a long time before any significant number of people um, is reemployed. It's not like they all go back to work the next day. That's not it. That can't be it. <clears throat> and so even if some people are not hungry, other people will remain hungry until we get the whole bubble machine working in tandem as a real economy. So, the, you know, the problem you describe is probably going to exist no matter what we do. Yeah, I mean, it kind of brings to mind, um, you know, what Hawaiian Electric has to do once uh, once their big generators go offline. Uh, they, they say it's a, a very a laborious process to restart the thing, you know, restart a little at a time. And then uh, when it gets up to speed, you, you know, put a little bit more gas into it uh, or, or whatever they burn. And then uh, ultimately after several hours, uh, you get the engine running at full speed again. I think that's kind of what we have here. Um, but That's a good analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but, but still um, it, it, it really, is is a kind of a different question from how are you altering the legal the legal landscape? And I think the uh, you know the government's got to got to make sure that and, and the rest of us have to make sure uh, that, that that we don't evolve into, into some kind of uh, dictatorship because that's uh, I think the temptation. Uh, but we we have to really avoid that if we want to if we value our democracy. Absolutely. Our democracy is at risk in so many ways these days, and, and that's one of them. And it's not just that the governor takes liberties now. It's that this condition is going to last for a while. And if he's able to take these liberties now, it's a precedent for him to take further liberties later. And then it also sets a precedent for taking liberties in the, in the next emergency. So we have to yeah, be very... Or there, there, there have been also cases uh, where presidents have kind of let the emergency declaration go on for a long time. Uh, this, this, uh, I, I think, was complained about in, in the Bush administration, uh, George W. Bush. Well, it all comes down to Benjamin Franklin. After the secret meetings in Liberty Hall in Philadelphia, where they were writing the Constitution, <clears throat> A woman approached him as he was going out for lunch, I guess. And she said, Dr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin, what kind of government will we have? 
And he said, well prepared for the question, a republic, madam, but only if you can keep it. And that's what we have to focus on now. Thank you, Tom Yamachika. Always great to talk to you. I hope we can talk again next couple of weeks and, and catch up on all the events that are sure to happen between now and then. Aloha. Thanks for having me on the show.